Oral Reading Test, Dr. Elizabeth Brackwell, September 25, 2009. Some of the doctors laughed at Elizabeth's plan. They said that no woman was capable of becoming a doctor. Even if she was accepted, she knew that she would have to pay her own way through school. Since father's death, the Blackwells had very little money. So for two years, Elizabeth had taught school. She had saved her money until she had put back enough for the year she would spend in medical school. Then the letter came for which she had longed. Elizabeth's determination was rewarded, and now at last her dream of medical school was about to come true. Inside the Geneva Medical School building, Elizabeth was met by the dean, Dr. Lee. Welcome to Geneva, Miss Blackwell, said Dr. Lee. Elizabeth noticed that Dr. Lee seemed nervous. Of course. It was a new experience for Dr. Lee, too. Elizabeth was to be his first wo woman student. She smiled. Thank you, Dr. Lee. It's a great honor for me to be able to come to your school. She hoped her voice didn't show how nervous she felt. What would the classes be like? Would the young men make fun of her? Suddenly, her mind was filled with questions, and she felt afraid and alone. Then Dr. Lee spoke again. You have missed the, fi the first five weeks of term, but I'm sure you'll be able to make up the word quickly. You have an outstanding record as a student. Elizabeth was encouraged by Dr. Lee's praise. Now, he went on with a smile, if you'll please follow me, I'll show you to the lecture room. There, I will introduce you to the other students. Quickly, Elizabeth followed him down the hall. The door to the lecture room stood ajar. From inside, Elizabeth could hear laughter and much loud talking. Dr. Lee asked her to wait outside. When he entered the room, the young man quieted down. Gentlemen, Dr. Lee announced, today Miss Blackwell will join your class. You all had a part in bringing her here. For the, fa for the falsity gave you an unusual opportunity. We let you vote on whether or not Miss Blackwell should be admitted to our school. Each one of you voted in favor of her entrance. Each one of you realized that at the time, Genova College would be admitting the first woman medical student in the history of the country. You deserve praise for helping give her this rare opportunity. Then Dr. Lee turned and left the lecture room. When he had returned, Elizabeth was with him. Gentlemen, he said, I should like to present you your new classmate, Miss Elizabeth Blackwell. A respectful hush followed the room as the quiet manner Elizabeth followed Dr. Lee to the platform. Though her heart still fluttered, Elizabeth felt her courage running, returning. The students wanted her as a classmate, and she must prove herself worthy of the honor. At, the time, at times, Elizabeth had feared this moment would never come, but now it was here. She knew that she could not fail. She could not disappoint those people who believed so deeply in her ability to succeed. With pride, glanced around, with pride, Elizabeth glanced around the hospital room. For today, May 12, 1857, one of her greatest dreams had come true. Today was the official opening of the New York Infirmary for Women and Children. Beside her stood her sister Emily. She, too, was now a doctor. On the other side of Elizabeth stood Dr. Mary Zark Zarksowitzia. Elizabeth had helped Mary to become a doctor, and, as she promised, she had encouraged Emily through the long years of medical training. Now, under Elizabeth's firm leadership, they had succeeded in founding the infirmary. It was the first of its kind in America, a hospital devoted to the care of women and children. Oh, Elizabeth, I thought this day would never come, Emily turned to her sister. Now we have our own hospital. It is difficult to believe, Elizabeth smiled. It's been eight years since I graduated from medical school, and how discouraged I used to feel during those hard years. For a long time, only a handful of patients came to me. Few people, even women, would I trust a woman, a, a woman doctor to care for them. Yes, Mary put in, but you still had the courage to go on. Because of you, I am now a doctor, and Emily has graduated from Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio, and is now a skilled surgeon. Elizabeth shook her head. The credit for today's success belongs to all of us. As she looked around the room, she saw many famous people and leading citizens of New York. Among them was Dr. Henry Ward Beecher, and there was Peter Cooper staying near one of the infirmary's new beds. With her head, head held high, Elizabeth stepped forward to open the official ceremony. Modestly, she reported the work that had been done in the past. She told hundreds of ill and needy who had been cared for her in her dispensary. No patient had ever been refused help because of poverty. The dispensary had welcomed the, children, the women and children of the slums of New York, and all who had come for help had been given the best of care, whether or not they could pay for the services. 
The education of women in medicine is a new idea, Elizabeth went on, and it takes time to prove that a new idea can be a valuable one. We hope, here at the infirmary, to continue this work. We must prove to the medical man, as well as the public, the, the skilled woman can bring to the medical profession. When Elizabeth finished speaking, there was much applause. Her friends knew she would do great work at the infirmary. The years proved that Elizabeth's friends were right. Shortly after the infirmary was open, every bed was filled. These patients had faith in woman doctors. Dr. Emily was the hospital surgeon. Dr. Mary was the resident physician. She spent all her time at the infirmary. Dr. Elizabeth was the director. Eight months after the infirmary opened, the doctors started a training program for nurses. Three courses lasting four months were offered. This will be another step forward for, men, for women. Elizabeth told Emily, we must allow only the best to take the courses. Well-qualified doctors and nurses can make great improvements in the medical field. The work at the infirmary settled into a smooth routine. Then Elizabeth began to think of what she could do outside the United States to educate women in medicine. She talked over this idea with Emily. Emily agreed there was much pioneering work to be done outside the United States. So in 1858, Elizabeth went on a lecture tour of England. As a result of her talks there, a movement was started to found a hospital in England, one like the New York Infirmary. When the Elizabeth returned to New York, she went to work on another new idea, a medical school for women. Abruptly, her plans were interrupted, for war was declared, the war between the states. Elizabeth was saddened by the news of war. She knew that the hospital would be crowded in the days to come. Her plans for a medical school must wait. Emily and Elizabeth were together when word came the fighting had started at Fort Sumter in the South. Elizabeth recalled how long ago her father had spoken against slavery. Yes, I remember, said Emily. Father thought it was very wrong for one person to own another as a slave. He said every man should be free. Yet it is sad that the northern states and southern states should go to war. During the war years, Elizabeth and Emily worked harder than ever. The inferno was overflowing with patients, but finally the war came to an end. The slaves have been freed. Now Elizabeth complained once again for a medical school for women. Once more, Elizabeth succeeded in making a dream come true. In November 1868, the College for Women opened officially at the infirmary. Its standards were high. Elizabeth saw to this. She wanted the college to offer the best medical education possible, and she made sure each student was good enough to enter the school. Entrance examinations were given, and only the best women students were accepted. Elizabeth taught a new course which every student was required to take. It was a course in hygiene. She taught the importance of cleanliness. Disease, she said, spread quickly in dirty slums, homes, or badly run hospitals. Much sickness could be prevented if people were taught the health-giving quality of fresh air and sunshine, she thought. Elizabeth was one of the pioneers in the field of hygiene. She felt doctors knew too little about it. Hospitals, she lectured, should be kept spotlessly clean. Much of the rest of her life was devoted to this cause. She gave hundreds of lectures and wrote books on the subject of hygiene. Through her efforts, great progress was made. When Elizabeth saw her dreams come true in America, she decided to go to England once more. In England, she would carry on a crusade for hygiene. Elizabeth was an old lady when she saw her family in America for the last time. She visited Emily, who now lived in Maine. Together, they celebrated Emily's 80th birthday and talked of her old times. 